In the 1990s, the slums of Rio de Janeiro were a dangerous place to live. Crime was high and the labyrinthine streets were teeming with abandoned children. It was the perfect place for a sadistic killer with a penchant for young boys. For eight months, he stalked the outskirts of Rio, killing and drinking the blood of his impoverished young victims completely unnoticed. Who knows how long his killing spree would have lasted had it not been for the wits of one young survivor. The Vampire of Niteroi made headlines in 1992, when his frank and horrifying confession shocked the entire country, cementing him as one of the most notorious serial killers in Brazilian history. Hello and welcome to the Little Shop of Crime. It's been a hot minute since I did a serial killer case, and by heck are we diving straight into the deep end with this one. Just in case you somehow missed the enormous list of warnings, it covers just about every sick taboo you can think of. It's genuinely the most depraved case I've ever researched. I don't ordinarily cover cases involving kids, but this story is just so unusual, and it's really sparsely covered outside of Brazil. And it's our first look at South America, and a killer that's been described as the continent's very own Jeffrey Dahmer. Not exactly an accolade to cherish, but it gives you a hint of what to expect here. This is the story of Marcelo Costa de Andrade, the vampire of Niteroi. Beautiful Rio de Janeiro, Brazil's most colourful and flamboyant city. Celebrated for its iconic landmarks, picturesque beaches and lively atmosphere. Feast your eyes on some carnival imagery. But don't get used to it, because this story is going to get very dark very fast. Because in the early 90s it wasn't all samba and fiestas. The city's vibrancy was a thin veneer pasted over a much darker reality. I think it's fair to say the streets of Rio back then weren't the safest place to be. Violent crime and homicide rates were amongst the highest in the world. The worst hit areas were the slums, or favelas as they're known. Like this one, Racina, the largest favela in Brazil cradled in a valley behind the watchful eye of Christ the Redeemer. In this shanty town, the luckiest ones had running water, or food on the rickety tables inside their precarious makeshift homes. Homes which cruelly overlooked the affluent neighbourhood of Gavea and the luxurious condos of Sao Conrado. The disparity between wealth and poverty was stark. Children from Racina would routinely scavenge for food, or try to earn money by selling gum at tourist hotspots, cleaning car windows, shining shoes, or, in most cases, simply begging. Thousands of street urchins relied on their wits to survive. In many cases, they'd be drawn into a life of crime. Thievery, drug trafficking, murder. It got so bad that residents of Rio found it difficult to sympathise with the growing number of young bodies found each day. Its streets were the perfect playground for a monster that preyed on young boys. In fact, such was the death toll in the city that for eight months, nobody even noticed that someone was out there picking them off one by one just for the fun of it. Marcelo Costa de Andrade was born in 1967 and spent much of his childhood roaming the narrow streets of Racina. And his life was, well... Let me start from the beginning. He was born into poverty, his mother Sonia a struggling maid, and his father a barman. His earliest memories are of watching him routinely beat her. By the time he was five, she'd had enough. His parents split, and Marcelo was sent to live with his grandparents in Ciara, 1,500 miles north of the city. But far from the favelas of Rio, Marcelo didn't escape physical violence. His grandfather regularly beat him, so badly that he caused several concussions and nosebleeds. When he was 10, his mother finally brought him home to live with her in her new home in Sao Gonzalo, on the other side of the polluted Guanabara Bay. But just like his father, his new stepfather was also abusive. He regularly fought with his mother, hit Marcelo with a belt, and demanded he leave the home. Once they separated, Marcelo was sent to live with his father instead. But the tempest of abuse seemed never-ending, and his new stepmother neglected and refused to feed him. Enough was enough. And before his 11th birthday, he ran away from home, to live alone on the streets of Rio, hustling and stealing to get by. But things took an extremely sinister turn, when Marcelo was egregiously assaulted and almost strangled to death by an older man. 
He was left disturbed and so broken that he tried to end his own life shortly afterwards. But he was soon picked up by a charity organisation, Casa de Meninos, or Boys House. They ran a boarding school for troubled young men in Rio. But his low IQ held him back, and despite repeated years, he was unable to complete the first grade. This fueled relentless bullying and taunting from his classmates, until the age of 14 that is, when he left. This was the maximum age of boys the house accepted. Once again he was homeless and hungry, and he began selling his body for food. According to him, his usual clients were older men who liked young boys. Sometime later he was sent to another institution, called a Funaben. The initials stand for long Portuguese words I won't even risk butchering, but it's basically a juvenile detention centre. But he escaped soon after, and his street routine continued. To a young Marcelo, violence was normality. It seems he spent his childhood being passed around and everywhere he went there was just this barrage of abuse. And, well, that's the beginning of so many serial killer stories right there. Occasionally with these cases the evil will manifest out of the blue, but not here. With Marcelo Costa de Andrade, the classic foundations of a psychopathic serial killer were very much being laid. So it's perhaps not shocking to learn that as a young teenager he killed a litter of kittens, and on one occasion he tried to violate his younger brother. As he got older, the darkness grew within him. He began to get more aggressive. He relished in making his little brother cry. According to his mother, Marcelo would record these cries on tape and obsessively listen back to the audio of them on loop. But at 16, Marcelo's life began to look more positive when he fell in love with an older man, Antonio, a 48-year-old doorman who offered support, allowed him to move in, and introduced him to the universal church of the kingdom of God. Their relationship lasted seven years, a period of relative stability for Marcelo, though even with his lover's support, he still occasionally prostituted himself. Eventually, things broke down, and Antonio moved away to Salvador. Marcelo went back to his mother, who now lived in an Itaborai slum. At 23, he began rebuilding his life though, working steadily selling purses and distributing pamphlets in the tourist district of Copacabana in order to support his family. Marcelo also continued his commitment to the Universal Church of the Kingdom of God. It's a fast-growing, highly controversial church, founded by a civil servant turned evangelical preacher in the 1970s. It strikes me as one of those, you know, give, give until it hurts, type churches. It offers protection from hexes and voodoo and blames all your misfortune on demons. Marcelo grew obsessed, attending services, reading magazines, and rarely missing the daily celebrations on TV. But little did anyone know that it was one speech in particular that would have a profoundly devastating impact on so many lives. It was a priest who told his followers that young boys, who didn't yet know right from wrong, would always go to heaven. This was like a light switch going off in his head. Young boys suddenly became fair game. In fact, if he killed them, he'd be helping them. He'd be releasing them from a terrible life of poverty, and handing them a golden ticket straight to paradise. The seed was planted for him to become one of Brazil's most depraved serial killers. April 1991 and now 24-year-old Marcelo was on his way home from work when he came across a boy of around 11 selling sweets in the street. Marcelo approached him and offered money and food in exchange for the boy's help, lighting some candles for St. George in a nearby church. They took a short bus ride together, before Marcelo dragged the lad into a secluded area and forced himself on him. The boy resisted, and so Marcelo struck him unconscious with some rocks, continued the attack, and then strangled him to death with his own t-shirt. As the victim was a homeless child, he was never reported missing. Marcelo visited the body twice afterwards and took some mementos, the boy's shorts and some of his teeth. On the third visit, he was no longer there. But Marcelo was intoxicated on the thrill of it. In his own words, the sadism went to my head. His second victim was that of an 11-year-old boy named Anderson, who was waiting at a bus stop. Again, Marcelo convinced him to follow him with the same story of lighting candles for St. George. But once in a secluded tunnel, Marcelo began his attack. And whilst he was forcefully having his way with the boy, he used a nearby stone to crack his skull open. This was the first time Marcelo tasted blood, which he drank eagerly. He even filled his work lunchbox to save some for later. 
Then, like last time, Marcelo used Anderson's own t-shirt to strangle the boy, before he broke his neck post-mortem and took his shorts as a trophy. Marcelo's third victim was just seven, and he found him wandering the streets of Niteroi. Using his signature method, he lured the boy into an abandoned building where he lay with him until he fell asleep. Once the boy was unconscious, he again used a rock to open his skull before he drank and collected the blood. And as usual, he strangled the boy, violated his body, and took his shorts, as well as some teeth, as a souvenir. Later that day, Marcelo arrived in Copacabana at his place of work, covered in blood. He made up some flimsy excuse, and no one questioned it. And as the months went by, the kills continued. Marcelo was oddly very selective with his victims. He'd look for those who reminded him of himself as a child. He'd stalk the boys for quite some time, prowling for the ones he found most beautiful. According to him, he only wanted the prettiest boys, with smooth legs and a pretty face and body. But in one particular murder, in June of 1991, there was definitely an indication of revenge. His name was Odair, an 11-year-old boy he found begging at a fuel station not far from his own home. He convinced the boy to come with him to collect some money from his aunt, which Marcelli would share with him. But of course, there was no aunt. Instead, the killer lured the unsuspecting boy onto a desolate and dark football field. And here's what he said happened next. I tried to take off his shorts, but as Odair resisted, I had to choke him. I didn't notice if he was alive or dead when I ravished him. I could not satisfy myself, and I squeezed his throat once more to make sure his soul went to heaven. That night after dinner, he convinced his mother to let him borrow her machete so he could cut down some ripe bananas he'd found. But here he explains the real reason he wanted it. I went back to the football field and sawed off Odair's head so that the children would make fun of him when he got to heaven just like my classmates teased me. Odair's murder made headlines in all the local newspapers. I mean, I could go on and describe each murder in detail, but I'd be repeating myself, and I'm sure you already get the picture. There was a certain ritual about his methods. He lured each with offers of sweets or money for the help of lighting candles for St. George, but instead he took them to secluded spots where he would sodomise and abuse them. When he was satiated, he would murder them with rocks, strangulation, or in two instances, by drowning. He would then almost always take their shorts. Marcelo used his soft-spoken voice, slight frame, and boyish appearance in order to assure his victims he was harmless. But of course, he was far from it. He always returned to the crime scenes to violate the bodies and take more souvenirs. He was also known to leave food offerings in order to nourish his victims' spirits. But despite earning the moniker the Vampire of Niteroi, he never actually claimed to be a vampire. He drank their blood so that, in his own words, he would be as young and cute as them. Marcelo carried his lunchbox of blood everywhere he went. In the midst of all the killings, Marcelo was still attending church four times a week, for four or five hours at a time. And all the while, in his twisted logic, he was killing them in order to send them to heaven. But his actions weren't those of a man gently helping children pass to the other side. He tortured them, often for the entire night, before doing unspeakable things to their bodies. He was one sick puppy, truly disturbed and driven by a lust for the darkest of depravities. For eight months this went on. Until mid-December 1991. On the afternoon of December 12th, a boy no older than six or seven was found by a fisherman, unresponsive, in a large sewer outlet by a deserted beach in Niteroi. His shorts were soaking wet. Another child drowned playing in Rio's sprawling sewers, it seemed. But something wasn't quite right. The child's hands were tucked neatly inside his pockets, an unlikely position for a drowning child to die. An autopsy revealed bruising inside his throat, the young boy had been asphyxiated and was the victim of a violent sexual attack. Investigators were no longer looking at an accident, but a homicide. But the boy carried no ID and investigators had no leads. Until two days later, when a woman turned up at a Niteroi police station to report her son as missing. She identified herself as Zelie de Abreu and before long she was screaming in despair positively identifying the boy in the sewer as her six-year-old son, Ivan. But what had led to this awful discovery? Well, it turned out Ivan's ten-year-old brother, Altair, knew exactly what had happened. 
It was three days ago, on December 11th. Ivan and Altair left their home and walked to the centre of Niteroi to beg for change so they could eat that evening. They lived in abject poverty, with their widowed mother and five other siblings. When the brothers arrived at Niteroi's central bus station, their paths unfortunately crossed with Marcelo, Costa de Andraji. They were hungry, and so naturally they jumped at the chance to earn some money just for helping the nice man light a few candles in the chapel of St. George. The trio walked for over four miles, and Ivan's little legs got tired, so Marcelo placed him on his shoulders. Eventually they ended up at a deserted beach. Marcelo put Ivan down and attempted to kiss Altair. Afraid, he tried to run, but was wrestled to the ground, and the furious maniac smashed the boy's head against some rocks. Marcelo then strangled young Ivan to death as Altair watched helpless. He later said, I was so paralysed by fear I could not run away. I watched in horror, tears streaming down my cheeks as he killed and then raped my brother. The killer then moved towards Altair, who could smell his dead brother on the man's clothes. But he didn't attack. Instead, he embraced him and said, I have sent Ivan to heaven. I love you. But he also warned Altair that if he screamed or ran away, that he would die too. Terrified, the ten-year-old did everything the killer asked. Marcelo took Altair to a nearby fuel station and cleaned some blood off him. The two then spent the night in some thicket nearby, where Altair was abused. Marcelo asked the young boy to live with him, and of course he agreed in fear. According to Marcelo, he became merciful towards the boy, and decided not to kill him because of his beautiful green eyes and passive nature. The following morning, the killer and his captive headed to Copacabana. Marcelo went to his place of work to collect a paycheck, but the streets were busy, and Altair took the opportunity to run away as fast as his little legs would allow. But Marcelo didn't chase him. Instead, he returned to Ivan's body, but not to hide it. He just placed his tiny hands inside his pockets so that the rats wouldn't gnaw on his fingers. And this strange, belated act of what could be perceived as a shred of kindness is what kick-started the whole investigation. It took hours for Altair to find his way home. When he finally arrived, he just sat and cried. His mother asked where Ivan was, but Altair was scared, and he told her that the two got separated and he couldn't find his little brother. Zeli was in despair, and for the next two days she searched the streets of Niteroi, but found no trace of her lost little boy. In the meantime, Altair's sisters suspected he knew more, and they finally managed to get the truth out of him. This is when they finally went to the police. Niteroi investigators were appalled by Altair's story. This monster had to be caught immediately. He was probably on the run now, hundreds of miles away, but his employer should at least be able to tell them who he was. There was just one snag. Altair couldn't remember where he worked. For days they tried and failed to jog his memory. Finally, they decided the only way was to retrace the entire route, from Niteroi bus station to the beach, the fuel station, and on to Copacabana. It was now December 18th, and when searching the streets near Copacabana Beach, Altair stopped and pointed. He'd seen one of Marcelo's pamphlets on the ground. It was for a jewellery store inside the iconic Roshi Cinema building nearby. The officers made their way there immediately. And to their shock, there they found Marcelo Costa de Andraji, casually eating his lunch. He was surprised it had taken them so long. I thought you were coming yesterday, he said. I killed him. Mercifully, this put an end to Marcelo Costa de Andraji's eight-month killing spree. But police didn't know this, because he confessed to killing Ivan, but insisted it was a one-off. But he made the investigators nervous. As he spoke about the events surrounding Ivan's murder, he kept laughing uncontrollably, and oddly, without any emotion. They knew the person they were dealing with was unhinged, but it wasn't until two months later, February of 92, that they realised the full extent of what they were dealing with. It was when Marcelo's mother was brought in for questioning. She reluctantly mentioned the night her son had borrowed the machete to cut down some bananas, but that night he returned with no bananas, just the machete, which was now smeared with blood along with his clothes. He made some flimsy excuse about having slaughtered a pig, but she didn't buy it, and she hid the machete afterwards. Police found the weapon in the house, along with Marcelo's stash of homoerotic magazines mixed with religious ones, 
as well as a polystyrene box that contained almost a dozen pairs of children's shorts, many of which were blooded. And faced with all of this evidence, Marcelo eventually confessed to killing 13 others, including one boy in the time between killing Ivan and when he was caught. He described each and every one in graphic detail. All of the victims were aged between 5 and 13. There was a potential 15th victim too, a boy Marcelo had left for dead in a quarry. But this boy's body was never found, and so his death hasn't been confirmed. Unsurprisingly, Altair never got over what he'd been through, and to add to the tragedy of his young life, he died from leukemia soon after. One by one, Marcelo escorted police to the location of each of his kills, where he reenacted his crimes and described in detail precisely what happened. In this photo, he's proudly showing officers the skeletal remains of one of his victims. Next to them were offerings of milk and bread, which he'd left to feed the child's spirit. But he also spoke matter-of-factly about how he even violated the skeleton. His depravity seemingly had no limits. Marcelo Costa de Andrade was assessed by several psychologists. Amongst other issues, he was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, schizophrenia and psychopathy. And all agreed he had a juvenile, totally inadequate view of the horrific crimes he'd committed. The depravity aside, Marcelo's mind is more or less the same as a 12-year-old. One psychiatrist speculated how the litany of abuse that took place during his childhood potentially left him on the precipice of puberty mentally, which is why he had a deep affinity or obsession with young boys. Either way, his upbringing had a profoundly destructive effect on him. As a result of his mental state, Marcelo was declared insane in March of 1992, and he was considered unaccountable for any of the crimes under Brazilian law. Instead, he was sent to the Hytor Carrillo Psychiatric Hospital in Rio. There, he remained heavily medicated and assessed every three years. If found eligible, it meant he could one day walk the streets as a free man. This sent shockwaves across the media in Brazil. The comparison between Marcelo and Jeffrey Dahmer was immediate, given not just the similarities, but also the fact that they unfolded at exactly the same time. The difference was that Dahmer was found guilty for his crimes. Still, it seemed unlikely Marcelo would ever get out. That is until five years later, in January of 1997, when an absent-minded guard accidentally left a door unlocked, and Marcelo just casually walked right out of there. Police frantically searched for him, and as the days went by, they prayed that a fresh string of dead children wasn't going to start showing up in his wake. Twelve days he was missing, until they eventually caught up with him in the town of Guaraciaba de Norte. Somehow, Brazil's most wanted man had managed to hitchhike over 1,600 miles to where his father now lived. Thankfully, he was spotted by a relative and soon apprehended, and no more children were hurt and he was clearly in the throes of a psychotic episode. He told police that he was on his way to the Holy Land because killing all those children meant that he was now purified. He was taken back to Rio, and in 2003 he was transferred to Hospital de Custodia Enrique Rocho in Niteroi, where he remains to this day. In the years since, Marcelo has been interviewed a number of times, and what's evident is that he still thinks he did those children a favour. There is no remorse whatsoever. In fact, the vampire of Niteroi relishes the infamy, and has spoken openly to multiple media outlets about his crimes. Ilana Cassoy, in her book Serial Killers Made in Brazil, spoke of her meeting with Marcelo. Meeting someone like Marcelo Costa de Andrade is very hard for any human being. I was sick in bed for four days after I talked to him. He is like a wolf dressed in sheep's clothing. Look at him, and you would never for a single second imagine what he is capable of doing with children. As soon as he told me that he took the shorts off every child he killed and kept them as trophies, he asked me to bring him a gift. A pair of new shorts. I'd never give them to him. I hope he stays in the psychiatric hospital for his entire life. In October 2017, Marcelo's defence filed a request for his freedom. The medical report was clear. He does not have the capacity to reintegrate into society under any circumstances. But Marcelo hasn't given up hope of one day being free. This is the most recent photo of him, taken in April 2021, 30 years to the month after his first kill. He's 56 now, and visited only by his mother once each year. With a mind as incurably diseased as his, he's thankfully unlikely ever to be released.
And that's the story of Marcelo Costa de Andrade, the vampire of Niteroi. It's difficult to reconcile my feelings about this case. He's quite clearly an incredibly sick individual. But the evil in him is probably the product of his upbringing combined with some serious cognitive issues. It's a bold statement, but he might be the sickest serial killer I've ever heard about. Obviously, I've had to heavily sanitise some of his confession for the sake of decency, but his perversity had absolutely no limits. Thank you so much for watching. Not a pleasant one. Not that any are, but if you'd like to see more from me, don't forget to subscribe. And if you press the like button, it'd really help me out. Thanks again for visiting, and hopefully I'll catch you at the next one. Bye for now.